Bobby Isaacs, one of the giants of automobile racing, has been spending this week out on Utah's Bonneville Salt Flats. I put in a call to Bobby to see how he's been spending his time. Well, uh, it's different from anything that I'll, I'll say that I've ever saw, and there's uh, no way to compare it with the asphalt that I run back in the south. That's a pretty barren country out there. Well, yeah, you can get kind of lonesome out here. You don't have to uh, don't have to get out too far till you get kind of lonesome. Well, you, you're using the uh, winged uh, Dodge Daytona, I guess. Uh, yes, I'm in a 1969 Dodge Daytona, hemispherical engine, 426 cubic inches. Uh, it's the same car that I would race on a on a noble track on the NASCAR circuit. That's all we have, you know, is uh, something that will run a race and. That's all we have is a racing crew, so mechanics got the car set up good, and uh, top speed is all you're interested in, see. A driver comes out here to break records, and uh, it's just all up to Mother Nature, I guess, whether we do or whether we don't. Bobby Isaac, the fastest race driver in the world. Be sure to watch for Bobby Isaac because he plans to be right on their bumper and hook right in the draft with him. Here comes the victory for Bobby Isaac. In the 1970 season, Bobby Isaac had the best car on the track. It's the number 71 k and It's poppy red. It's a Dodge Charger Daytona. Buddy Barrett with Harry Hyde and the rest of the crew as Isaac drives them to victory lane. My competition in the point race seemed to, seemed to fall away, and uh, I seemed to be left all by myself. Bobby Isaac, NASCAR Grand National Champion. Long before he showed up at the big leagues, Bobby Isaac started racing on dirt tracks to places like Hickory. Bobby drove his first race ever here at the Hickory Motor Speedway. He had a lot of fans in this area because the people in this area knew the background that he came from. Crowd really loving this. First time that I ever met him, he delivered lumber to my dad's lumber yard. So we became friends from that. He didn't have much formal education. So as a result, he just didn't say a whole lot. Bobby was a mysterious character. He didn't give a lot of interviews. He didn't like journalists. So, you know, there's not much written about him. He wasn't a people person. He very seldom would talk to any of us or anything. He was real timid. He was embarrassed about all that, but he could drive a race car. I don't think many people expected him to become a superstar in the sport, but he did just through his desire and will to do things that the common man doesn't do. In 1970, the number 71 KNK Dodge Daytona actually set the closed course record for a NASCAR sanctioned event at Talladega. There's nothing in the world that could beat a race car that's got a wing over the roof of the car. It was the greatest car they ever built. NASCAR come down on us like a ton of brick. They put a restrictor plate on us. We got to Daytona after Talladega. We was 12 miles an hour slower in the field. Honest to God. Those cars were certainly in a class by themselves. It was headed in a direction, of course, that NASCAR didn't want it to head. Getting away from the normal cars that were built that people were driving on the street. Prior to this, people would buy a stock car, turn it into a race car. Now, Chrysler's building race cars and selling them to get around the rule of making them stock. They're doing it backwards. So Bobby Isaac and the k, &K team actually pushed these things to the limit and forced them to change the rules to say, okay, we have to do away with the nose cones and the wings. We've got to back this all down now because it's getting out of control. And they got rid of it. When the car got put out to pasture in 1971, Nord Krauskopf, that owned the team, feels, hey, this is a crying shame. We've got the fastest car on earth, and we can't drive it anymore. And then they realized, oh, wait, we can drive it. We just can't race it at NASCAR anymore. Nord is the kind of guy, if NASCAR changed the rules some way or another, or things weren't going just right, he'd just pull out. There were several different sanctioning bodies for racing in America in the 1970s. There's, of course, NASCAR, and there's USAC. One of the things that USAC kept track of was land speed records at Bonneville. So they contact USAC, can we attack a bunch of speed records out of the Bonneville Salt Flats? 
if anybody didn't think you should do it. That meant we were going to do it. And that's the way Bonneville come along. And everything else that we did with those cars was done because somebody said, don't do it. Hey, Red Dog. Won't you, won't you show me your way? Won't you show me that? Harry was the crew chief, the creator, the engineer, anything you want to say. Chief mechanic, uh, team chief leader, mechanic. team manager, I was, that was the man. I lived with Harry, literally. I was in my mid-twenties when all this was going on, and, and I was just a Tennessee hillbilly hot rodder, and I didn't know where to live. He said, get your bag out of your car, you can stay in that bedroom right there next to me while you're here. Well, I wound up living there for about two years after that with Harry. During the day in the shop, he was like a patent. He was firm, he's a football coach, get the job done. When we went in the house, we sat there at the table, we eat breakfast, we cook. He was my daddy then. And uh, he said, son, when we work, we work, and when we play, we play. And boy, was that an understatement. I found that on both sides. <laughs> Harry High just had the ability to bring out the best in everybody. What you see is what you get. I can't help it. I just say what I think and what I honestly believe and I act like I really am. He was the hardest guy in the world on us, but he was the greatest guy. I'd never worked on a race car before, but he taught me how to be competitive. He was the best at it, and I'll always be indebted to him. I spend more time with these people than I do my family. I travel with them, I live with them. We cry together, we, we rejoice together. So I, I think probably that I would be lost without him unbelievable the passion that Harry had and especially how close-knit our crew was. We was a family. We didn't know a thing about Bonneville. The first thing we thought was how could it snow and it was so hot outside. It was just racing to us and that's all we wanted to do. We had a job getting paid for playing. One of the things we wanted to get out of the way was the 10 mile circle run. We had a half inch drill with a long drill bit and we would drill holes in the salt to put the steak. We got us a cooler over at the little grocery store and, and a couple uh, six packs for the first day and I think it wound up two or three more six packs per day. It took us about two and a half days and about uh, two and a half cases of beer. You know, we were really professionals. <laughs> <laughs> but he would have a good time now. I called it extra to contract. You know, it was a great opportunity for a bunch of renegade racers from Harrisburg, North Carolina, to come out to this wonderful place. And as the old saying says, we were loaded for bear. The team that they took to Utah to try to set those speed records, they were unique, every one of them. But I think it was the right team for Bobby Isaac. They all have a different fascination of wanting to make that car go fast. For the person he was, Bonneville was a perfect situation for him because it was him alone. If you ain't talking, you don't hear nothing. You don't see nothing but salt. The solitude that he had, relaxed and quiet, doing something he liked to do without having to think about the world or anything. I'm just gonna do this one thing. Knowing Bobby, yeah, he liked that. The driver today, they might, they might worry about getting their feet dirty or something, I don't know. Yeah. Isaac run this course and that car was never straight. It was in a yaw position all the way through. You know, speeds are relative to conditions. To drive good and successful on a dirt track, you really have to have a seat of the pants feeling of the race car. And uh, he had that, naturally. That's what he grew up in, his old dirt track style. He was a back at home, you know. He just felt comfortable doing that. But it was a sensation. It was just going so fast. He could hardly explain it. In fact, he told me that it felt like the car was flying at times. It just felt like he didn't have any contact with the earth. I had a, a long telescope, and I was watching the car. I hollered at Harry. I said, Harry, this car has left the ground. 
the mirage of the salt, it made it look like the car had taken off into the air. It looked like a big fireball going across the sky. And that's what it was. It was a badass meteor. <laughs> Bonneville was actually the culmination of several things all happening at the right time. So you've got this perfect car, the Dodge Charger Daytona. It's the most aerodynamic car Detroit's ever built. The car is tuned and handled by Harry Hyde, one of the greatest crew chiefs in NASCAR history. And behind the wheel, you've got Bobby Isaac, who's one of the greatest drivers in NASCAR history, particularly on a surface that's similar to dirt. So when all of this comes together at Bonneville, they set 28 world speed records. It was just amazing at what they had accomplished to put a car out there that would go faster than anybody had ever gone before. 216 miles per hour in a stock bodied car running a carburetor. It's insane they did that in 1971. Speeds haven't increased that much in NASCAR in all the time since then. During the time and era, it didn't mean that much then, but now I look back and say, thank you God, what an opportunity, a legacy. And I'm telling yeah. you what, we had our chest stuck out like that. Back then, we were hard racers. And to achieve what we did, it was way before its time. And I think right now, it's almost catching up. Let's get that gate down so we can see the mean machine. <laughs> the bad boy. Yeah. 45 years ago, we rolled it off of a, off of a, just a regular little old uh, trailer. And today it got a free ride out here. What a beautiful car sitting there. But we're gonna let it get its feet wet in a little bit. Put some of this white salt on it. One more time. Yeah! <laughs> All right, mother up. <laughs> this morning, it made cold chills come on my whole body to be able to see that car 45 years after. It just doesn't get any better than this. It's history. Yeah. The worst don't describe it. I looked around, and I looked up, and I started getting flashbacks. Here I see wells and stuff, everything that I built. Look at that, that was a backup light on that old panel. That's a real panel, yeah. that was a backup light. Just to be out here and do this is an honor and blessing to me. This thing brings back so many memories. God, everybody should give Tim Welburn a hand because he has preserved something that's so wonderful. In 1969, my father took me to the very first Talladega 500 race. Bobby Isaac just became my idol that day because of the looks of this car. I was only like 12 years old at that point. But when I left there, I just thought someday I'm gonna own one of those. So being here at the Salt Flats, redoing what Bobby Isaac done, it is truly exhilarating to be here. Let's get this thing prepped up and ready for a run. Well, you know, sounds good to me. We didn't bring it out here just to look at it. <laughs> Let's get some stuff out of here. Oh Y'all might God. remember this from the Oh, day. yeah, and, man. Uh, oh, yeah. No, that's got the real deal. I saw buddy. It is. And then we, here's one of the real uniforms, too. That's beautiful. We're going to wear today. Now, what you guys will realize is these uniforms, they're made different now for these drivers than they were back then. Back then, you had to have a lot of ballroom. <laughs> I <bet> you <laughs> Understand? <laughs> Played a black mark now. <laughs> He's having fun. Nothing could tell you the feeling of thinking like Bobby Isaac and looking over that very hood that he looked over as this white salt went by and it got faster and faster and faster. I wish we could get today's fans to relate to the legacy of the sport and maybe this could be a stepping stone in the right direction. The Bobby Isaac and the winged car legacy, that's one of those great American tragedies when somebody does something so well that the powers that be have got to put them out of business. So I think a lot of people look at that and go, wow, what might have been if they hadn't been outlawed?
Let me tell you something. Well, I'm a country boy from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Wouldn't never got out of the state probably if it hadn't been for this orange Dodge race car. I'm so proud that it's still around and I'm so proud that I'm one of the few that got to experience it. I'm very blessed to be here with this car. I get emotional thinking about it. Uh, I went from working in a factory to an opportunity to work with this crew here, this team, and make a living at it. Long story short, I stayed doing it till 1995, and uh, I don't never look back. I never change it. Excuse me, but uh, this car did it all. Started in 1970. It literally changed my entire life proud that we were able to do this in honor of Harry Hyde, Bobby Isaac, and all the crew guys that aren't with us. That's why we're here today. Peace on to you, brother. We came out here to set records. We set records. You got it, man. <laughs>